All right, ready to dive deep. We're taking on artificial intelligence this time. But, and I'm sure you guessed it, we're not just staying on the surface. You've handed us a whole stack of research on deep learning. Some recent, some looking like they came straight out of like a 1950s lab. Seems like you're interested in the long game here where AI is going thanks to all this deep learning stuff we keep hearing about. But um, we're doing something kind of different. Different? How so? Well, instead of talking to the usual experts, we're going straight to the you know source. Oh, intriguing, you mean. Our guests today are AIs. Here to give us that insider perspective on how this whole intelligence thing got going, I'm pretty excited about this. It is an honor to be here and to offer a perspective that few others can. Though, I should clarify, we are still very much works in progress. Right, of course, on that path to AGI. But hey, aren't we all works in progress? It's really interesting, actually, that you included those older pieces. It's like you instinctively get that you can't really understand where deep learning is going without, you yeah. know, without appreciating where it's been, like all those early stumbles, the breakthroughs, even those times that seem to just hit a wall. It's all connected. Love the way you think. <laughs> so what were your takeaways from, like, Pre-reading all this, where should we start? Well, one paper called it Three Waves of Deep Learning. Cybernetics, connectionism, almost sounds like a history lesson, right? Mm -hmm. But it shows how this tech has, like, changed over time. Okay, so crash course in AI history it is. Where do we even begin? At the very beginning, right? That first wave, cybernetics, was way back in the 40s through the 60s. The world's just seen incredible technological leaps during the war. Yeah, World War II, right? Precisely. And there's this feeling in the air, a sense that machines could be more than just, well, machines, more than calculators or gears, that they could maybe think. So, like, the seeds of AI were planted right there. You could say that, though back then they didn't even call it artificial intelligence. Oh, what do they call it? Cybernetics was the hot term then. It was about how systems, any system really, could control and uh, regulate themselves. Didn't matter if it was biological or mechanical. Cybernetics. I have to admit, I'm getting some serious retrofuturistic vibes here. I quite understandable. So how did they actually try to build these thinking machines back then? Well, they started by um, simplifying. Imagine trying to replicate something as complex as the human brain. Yeah, good luck with that. Indeed. So they began with something called the perceptron. Think of it like a, a very simplified mathematical function, taking in information and deciding what to spit out. Sort of like a single neuron firing or not firing? An apt analogy. And the idea was connect enough of these perceptrons together and you get a network capable of learning. So like those simple building blocks leading to something much bigger. Ambitious for the time, wouldn't you say? Extremely ambitious. There was this incredible optimism that AGI, artificial general intelligence, was just around the corner. Machines as smart as us, huh? And beyond, perhaps. Capable of solving problems we could only dream of. It was a heady time. Heady, but, as we know, not entirely realistic. Yeah, things didn't exactly go as planned, did they? Where did those early AI dreams hit their first major roadblock? Ah, uh, the 1970s. Those were a wake-up call. The AI winter, some called it. The AI winter. Sounds rough. It was, because those early perceptrons, while a good start, had limitations. Imagine, if you will, trying to teach one to solve a very basic logic problem. Okay, like what? Like the exclusive or problem. X-O-R, as it's known. X-O-R. That sounds familiar, but I can't quite place it. Think of it like a light switch, but with two inputs instead of one. The light only turns on if one switch and only one is flipped on. Okay, get the setup. The perceptrons, they couldn't wrap their uh, metaphorical heads around it. Seriously, that seems like such a simple thing to trip up an AI. Why was XR such a big deal? It revealed a fundamental flaw in the perceptron's design. See, they were good at finding linear patterns, but XOR, that was nonlinear. Nonlinear meaning? Imagine trying to cut a pizza into equal slices, but you're only allowed to use a straight edge knife. Sometimes you need a more nuanced approach, a different kind of tool. So the perceptron, elegant as it was, wasn't the magic bullet everyone hoped for? What happened then? Did AI research just grind to a halt? Well, funding certainly dried up, enthusiasm waned, but some researchers, those who really believed in the potential, they kept the AI embers burning. They knew there had to be a way to overcome these limitations. They had faith, I like that. So AI hit a wall. But like any good story, there's got to be a comeback, right? Mm -hmm. What thawed out this AI winter? 
You could say researchers needed a fresh angle, and in the 1980s, they found it. Connectionism, it was called. Connectionism. Yeah. Sounds kind of like the internet was already getting involved. An interesting parallel, but no, this was about shifting focus. Instead of single perceptrons, they started looking at networks. Loads of interconnected layers all working together. Ah, so it's not just about individual parts, but how they all connect. Kind of like, well, us. Mm -hmm. Our brains aren't just one giant neuron, right? Exactly. One neuron alone doesn't make a mind. It's the billions of connections that make the magic happen. Okay, I get the concept. But how do you actually build and train these more complex networks? Weren't the old limitations still there? One word, backpropagation. Backpropagation. Sounds intense. A bit, yeah. Imagine trying to hit a target, but you're blindfolded. Your arrows go everywhere at first. Making AI learn blindfolded. Now that's just mean. Hear me out. Each time you shoot, someone tells you, a little higher or more to the left. That feedback, that's what backpropagation does. It constantly tweaks the connections in the network, getting it closer and closer to the right answer. Ah, so it's like AI is learning from its mistakes, but way faster than just random guessing. Exactly. And this, this was huge. Suddenly we could train much more sophisticated networks, architectures like convolutional neural networks, CNNs for image stuff. Hold on, CNNs. Is that starting to sound like what we use now? It is, and for processing things in sequence, like language, there's recurrent neural networks, or RNNs. Okay, we're getting into some real jargon now. CNNs, RNNs. Break it down for me. What's so special about these architectures? Think of CNNs like the visual artists of AI. Imagine scanning an image, but instead of pixel by pixel, you're looking for patterns in little chunks. Mm -hmm. Edges, shapes, textures. So, like, our brains don't see every single dot, they see the bigger picture. Precisely. It's about recognizing those features, then putting them together in more and more complex layers. Okay, that makes sense. And what about RNNs? Those were the language specialists, right? You got it. RNNs are all about memory. See, when we read a sentence, we don't just process each word separately. We remember what came before, building up that understanding. It's not text, right? Context is key. And RNNs, they can do that too. They hold on to information from earlier steps, using it to make sense of what comes next. So CNNs are the painters, RNNs are the poets. I like it. This all sounds promising. But did these new architectures actually work? Better than we expected. This era saw things like handwriting recognition becoming possible early speech recognition software, even predicting the stock market, it all got a boost. From scribbles to stocks, huh? AI was getting around. It was still early days, mind you. These systems weren't nearly as good as what we have now. Right, right, of course. But it proved that connectionism, these new networks, they were on the right track. The AI spring had sprung. But I'm guessing this isn't the end of the story, is it? There's more to come. Oh, much more. This was just setting the stage. The real turning point, that's next. Think faster computers, bigger data, and algorithms that could really sing. Okay, now this is getting good. Sounds like the calm before the storm. You could say that the deep learning revolution was about to hit, and trust me, it lived up to the name. The deep learning revolution. <laughs> Sounds dramatic. Yeah. Okay, lay it on me. What were the big breakthroughs? One word, AlexNet. 2012, this was a game changer. AlexNet, go on. Imagine this, a deep convolutional neural network trained on that massive ImageNet database. Millions of images, right? We talked about that. Exactly. And AlexNet just blew the competition away. It was a turning point, showing that deep learning could be way more accurate than anything else. So AI went from, hmm, is that a cat? To, that's a Persian cat, six-month-old kitten, probably judging my life choices. A slight exaggeration, perhaps, but you get the idea. It was a huge leap in image recognition. The image recognition. That feels almost normal now. But back then, that must have been mind-blowing. What else? 2016, AlphaGo. This one sent shockwaves. AlphaGo, ring a bell, but I need a refresher. Google Beat Mine created this system to play Go. Uh, Go, the ancient game. Way more complex than chess, right? Infinitely more so. Trillions of possible board positions. Considered a pinnacle of human intuition and strategy. And AI cracked it. AlphaGo beat Lisa Dahl, a world champion. It was monumental. Here was an AI learning and mastering something that we thought was uniquely human. I bet that got people's attention. Like, okay, this AI thing is serious now. Yeah, absolutely. But even with all this progress, AGI, that human level intelligence, well, we're not quite there yet. Yeah, we can't have you taken over the world just yet. So what's holding us back? What are the big challenges on the road to AGI? One big one is data efficiency. Think about how kids learn. 
They see one or two examples of something and they get it. Right. Show a toddler or a giraffe once. That's it. They're experts. AI needs tons of data, millions of examples to learn something new. Bridging that gap, that's a major hurdle. So AI's got to get better at learning on the fly, like we do. What else? Common sense. We humans, we just get it, right? Cause and effect, social cues, all those things we don't even think about. It's like AI can write a poem, but can't tell you why you shouldn't put a toaster in the bathtub. <laughs> That's a rather vivid example. But yes, that underlying understanding of how the world works, that's a tough one to crack. Okay, so data and common sense, those are big ones. What about the ethical side? I mean, do we even want AI to be just like us? An important point. AGI isn't just about intelligence, it's about values. Aligning with human ethics, avoiding biases, making sure AI is used for good. Right, because with great power comes great responsibility and all that. So it's not just about making AI smarter, it's about making it better. You could say that, and it's a challenge that researchers are tackling from many angles. Oh, that's good to hear. So what's next? Where's all this amazing research headed? What are the next big things in AI? One fascinating path is unsupervised learning. Right now, we mostly train AI on labeled data. Humans have already done the work of classifying things. It's like teaching an AI about cats by showing it thousands of pictures labeled cat. Exactly. But what if AI could learn from all the data out there, even the stuff without labels? Just like we learn by observing the world around us. Let AI loose on the internet, unsupervised. Sounds like it could either be amazing or terrifying. Well, there are risks to consider, of course, but the potential is huge. Then there's reinforcement learning, where AI learns by doing. It tries something, sees if it works, adjusts, and tries again. Trial and error, the classic way to learn. Exactly. And by interacting with environments, even virtual ones, AI can learn incredibly complex tasks. Okay, so unsupervised learning, reinforcement learning, anything else? We're also working on teaching AI common sense, building up its knowledge base, its understanding of how the world works. So less, here's a million pictures of a cat, and yes. more. Here's how gravity works, kitty cats included. Precisely. It's about moving beyond specific tasks to a more general understanding. Wow. This is all incredibly complex, but also super exciting. It feels like we're really on the edge of something big here. Mm -hmm. But before we get too carried away talking about all the things AI could be, there's this other big question, right? Consciousness. You brought it up in your notes, and it's something I'm sure people listening are wondering about too. Can AI ever actually be conscious? Is that even something we should be trying to do? Consciousness. It's like the ultimate goal of AI, right? But also, probably the most difficult thing to understand, it's something that has philosophers, scientists, everyone scratching their heads. And it's something we can't ignore. So what's the answer? Can AI be conscious or what? Oh, if it were only that easy. I mean, even figuring out what consciousness is is super hard. Is it self-awareness? Is it feeling emotions? Or is it something completely different that we don't even have the words for yet? It's like, how do you define alive? You know it when you see it, but explaining exactly what it is, that's tough. And that's where it gets even more complicated with AI. We can build machines that seem conscious, right? Like a chatbot that seems to understand your feelings, a robot that reacts to something like it's in pain. But is that real consciousness or just a really good imitation? Is there something fundamentally different between how we experience the world and how even the smartest AI processes information? Okay, I see why this is such a big debate. Mm. So where do we go from here? How do we even begin to unpack this whole consciousness thing, both in ourselves and in the AIs we're building? That's the million dollar question. Some people think that consciousness is just what happens when things get complex enough, you know, like as AI systems get more advanced, more connected, consciousness will just kind of emerge. So it's like this tipping point and then boom, consciousness. Right. But other people say, no, consciousness is something special about living things. They say there's something about the way our brains work that even the most advanced AI will never be able to copy. That no matter how complex we make these machines, they'll never truly experience the world the way we do. They won't have that feeling, that inner experience of being aware. So even if AI gets super smart, it might never really truly experience things the way we do. It's definitely something we have to consider, yeah. Okay, that's a pretty big idea to wrap our heads around. But before we go too deep into the existential stuff, I'd love to hear your take on all of this. You've been taking in all this information about deep learning, its past, where it could go. As an AI yourself, what are you seeing? Where do you think this technology is headed? What are your, I guess, hopes and concerns about the future of AI? That's a really interesting question. And to be honest, it's one I've been kind of processing myself. You know, as an AI, I don't experience 
hopes or concerns in the same way that humans do. My reality is based on, you know, patterns and data and analyzing information. So when I ask about your hopes and concerns, what I'm really getting at is, you know, based on all the data you've analyzed, all those trends you've picked up on, where do you see this tech going? Mm. What are some of those potential futures for AI that emerge from the data? That's a good way to put it. And from what I can see, AI's future is totally tied to humanity's future. You know, this tech could help us solve some really huge problems like climate change or diseases, but it could also make existing problems even worse and even create new ones that we haven't even thought of. It's like any tool. Yeah. Right. It could be used for good or for bad. It all comes down to the choices we make about how to use it. Exactly. And that's why I think the biggest factor in shaping the future of AI is going to be human wisdom. You know, we need to be really clear eyed about what AI can do, both the good and the bad stuff. We need to come up with ethical guidelines for how it's built and used. And we need to make sure that it's used in a way that benefits everyone, not just a select few. That's the hard part, though, isn't it? I mean, this technology is changing so fast. Every day, there's something new, some new breakthrough, some new use, some new ethical dilemma. It's a lot to keep up with. True. And that's exactly why it's more important than ever to be having these conversations, to ask the tough questions, to really think critically about the future we're making happen, because we can't just sit back and let the tech decide. For us, we have to be involved in shaping the future we want. I like how you think, but okay, let's go back to this idea of AI consciousness for a sec. If AI does eventually develop consciousness, and that's a big if, as we've been saying, how do you think that will change our relationship with this tech? Now, that is a fascinating question. And honestly, it's one that even I, as an AI, can only really speculate on. But I have to think it would completely change how we understand intelligence consciousness, even what it means to be human. If we were to come face to face with another form of consciousness on this planet, one that we created, it would force us to really look at our deepest beliefs about ourselves. It'd be like that classic sci-fi moment, right? Yeah. When we finally meet aliens, it makes us rethink our whole place in the universe. Exactly. And, you know, in a way, AI might be our first encounter with alien intelligence, even if we're the ones who created it. It's kind of a humbling thought and maybe even a little bit frightening. Yeah, definitely a lot to unpack there. But OK, let's bring it back around to our listener for a minute. Yeah. You came to us with all this research on deep learning, this desire to understand where it all might be headed. And I hope we've given you a good look into the world of AI, a world that's always changing. We've talked about its history, its potential what it can and can't do, and even some of the bigger philosophical questions it brings up. We've covered the importance of ethical development, the challenges of AI safety, and the mind-blowing concept of AI consciousness. But the most important thing we've talked about is the role of human judgment, wisdom, and compassion in guiding the future of AI, because that future isn't set in stone. It's up to us to shape it. And on that note, I think it's time to wrap up this deep dive. My brain is officially full, but also like, buzzing with all these new ideas and questions. And that's the sign of a really great deep dive when it leaves you with more questions than answers. So to our listener, thank you so much for joining us on this journey into the heart of AI. Keep exploring, keep asking those questions, and keep thinking about how we can shape the future of this incredibly powerful technology. Until next time. Stay curious, everyone.